Well, hello, everybody. It's good to see you. Um, today, the topic is Echo Pentecost. And for 2,000 years, we Christians have known about the amazing gift of Holy Spirit. And many of us have been taught about the power manifested because of the original outpouring of our gift of Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And I ask, what are we doing with that knowledge? You know, how do we echo what happened on Pentecost? I recently heard a quote, you can learn by doing, but you cannot do by learning. And this made me think, what am I doing with my learning? What am I doing with my gift? Mark Twain said, the two most important days of your life are the day you're born and the day you find out why. And I, I wanted to add to that, that the most important day of any life is the day we move from education to action. And the ultimate greatest day of our life is when we truly begin to echo Pentecost. On the, on the day of Pentecost, the apostles were touched from head to toe, inside and out, with an individualized portion of Holy Spirit. And they made such an amazing impact on society because they were disciplined in, in developing their body, their soul, and their spirit each and every day. It takes developing all three in order to live a complete life. It takes all three to become a complete person. And each day we try to improve our health. Each day we take the time to develop our mind by pushing ourselves mentally and socially. And by all means, we get in touch with our spiritual side by getting a handle and on and developing who we are spiritually. They're all important. You can't throw one out and keep another. We have to be good at all three. So let's, let's light the fire under ourselves and improve ourselves each and every day. And we do this physically, mentally, and spiritually. Let's increase and spread the amazing wealth of who we are day by day. And that's how we echo Pentecost. So now we're going to get started. How should we echo this thing we call Pentecost? We've all been taught about Pentecost. And, but how do we echo that knowledge? How do we make it reverberate? How do we make it move from person to person? Or just move within ourselves day by day by day? Go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read a few voice, verses <laughs> from the voice. <laughs> a few voices. <laughs> voices from the voice. And uh, so in chapter 2, verse 1, When the holy day of Pentecost came, 50 days after Passover, they were gathered together in one place. Picture yourself among the disciples. A sound roars from the sky without warning. The roar of a violent wind and the whole house where you're gathered reverberated with the sound. Now welcome the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to explain this. Or you could say, say hello to my little friend. <laughs> and some say this sound was the loud breathing of the apostles per Jesus' instruction on the day of his resurrection. And to understand this, to understand any further, we have to go back in time 50 days. So if you want to, go to John 20. We're going to be back in Acts 2, and we're going to read verse eight, starting verse 18. Mary Magdalene announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and this is what he said to me. It doesn't say what she said in the Bible. Because what she said isn't as important as the perfect timing of her announcement. Like a friend running across town to personally announce to all her eager group of friends about the healthy birth of a new child, that's sort of what it was like. You know, all they wanted to know is, is the baby alive and is he breathing? Jesus Christ rose from the dead. She got the message across. And verse 19, on that same evening, Resurrection Sunday, the followers gathered together behind locked doors in fear that some of the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem were still searching for them. Out of nowhere, Jesus appeared in the center of the room. Now, what would that be like? 
It would be as random as a newborn baby throwing off its blanket, walking upright into the center of a crowded room, raising its little puffy arms to get their attention, and dominating the conversation. That's how crazy it would be to have Jesus appear in that room. Especially when they're afraid. Jesus, may each one of you be at peace. As he was speaking, he revealed the wounds in his hands and side. The disciples began to celebrate as it sank in that they were really seeing the Lord. Seeing the resurrected Christ would be a lot to take in, especially after they had seen him beat all to hell and stake to a post. And then they saw him die. Some of them knew where he was buried. They saw him get buried. I believe Jesus would have had their attention about that time, don't you think? And they would, have, they would have put away their smartphones. They might have put them on privacy mode thinking, this is going to be good. <laughs> I mean, what would you think if the Christ appeared right here, right now, or right in your room, wherever you are, in your car, if you're driving? What would you feel like? It would be crazy good. Jesus, verse 21, I give you the gift of peace. In the same way the Father sent me, I am now sending you. And he drew close enough to each of them that they could feel his breath. He breathed on them. Jesus, welcome the Holy Spirit of the living God. Jesus probably went around the room and breathed a warm breath on each of those men that day. They would have been sitting there on the floor, and he was, he was standing in the, in the midst of them. He would have walked up to each of them, might have put his hands on their shoulder and just went, ah, ah, just breathed on them. And they wouldn't understand the significance of that for 50 days. And so why would he do that? Well, um, you know, it showed that he was alive. When you feel somebody's warm breath on you, that tells you something, right? If you've ever, ever been around somebody who took their last breath, what does that mean? They're dead. They're dead. But if somebody who has been dead is breathing now, what are they? Alive. They're alive. They felt it. This simple ge gesture of breathing in their face, it, it both proved that he was alive and breathing, and number two, it showed that there was a new life, a new version of spirit, a new birth, if you will, awaiting them also. He had talked about this many times during his ministry, but it wasn't fully there. Many of you have been taught something called the great mystery. Well, the word mystery it's not, a, it's not a single unveiling like, like people think. The term mystery in the Greek, it's, it's, a, it's a continual unveiling. The mystery had been partially unveiled ever since Adam and Eve. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. But it was fully unveiled. It was fully understood, this great mystery. That's when, when great things began to happen. The term mystery is just a continual unveiling until it's you can finally understand or finally see and so uh, you know Jesus was physically and spiritually making a point here and here is and this is really how um, to welcome the, the birth of this amazing advantage called Holy Spirit is you know they all knew the, the first they all knew that the first time this breathing, in someone's face was mentioned in the Bible, uh, was talking about God when it says that he, quote, breathed the breath that gives life into the nostrils of the human, and the human became a living soul. Genesis 2, 7 from the voice. They all knew that. That was the first time Jesus did the same thing to them. What God did to, to Adam in, the, in way back when, he, did to, he breathed right on them. It's more symbolic, is it not? 
Would that have made a bigger impact than him just standing there going, <sighs> they would say, man, he must be tired in that resurrected body. Um, the words breath in the Hebrew back in Genesis means, means to blow with force. <sighs> He could have just blown in their face. On a side note, did you know that the rituals from almost every religion involve some reference to breathing in and out? All religions have this. And some use it for cleansing. Some breathe on people or blow smoke on somebody to shoo away the evil. Um, some call this discipline breathing chi. And it helps them feel more connected with the universe. And what about the first breath after emerging from the baptismal water? You know, to those groups that practice full immersion baptism, that first breath, when, you, when people's head comes back out of that water, represents a newness of life, does it not? You see, being made aware of our breath is the simplest way to prove that we're alive. That's how simple this is. Receiving Holy Spirit is as simple as breathing. That's part of the point here. It's as simple as breathing in and breathing out. Now back to Jesus' final comment in verse 22. And I love the dramatics here. Remember, he's in his resurrected body. There's, there's uh, 11 guys there. Thomas is gone, which means Judas is in that room. You see? And, uh, and Jesus ex exhales heavily, or he, or he blows on each of them. And then with a flourish of drama, he raises his hands in the air and he said, Welcome, the Holy Spirit of the living God. You think he was teaching them something there? Oh, yeah. He was teaching them. The echo of sound. Back to Acts 2. Now, we're going to start it all over again, in case you got lost. Verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost came, 50 days after Passover, they were gathered together in one place. 2, picture yourself among the disciples. A sound roars from the sky without warning, a roar of a, of a violent wind, and the whole house where you're gathered reverberated with the sound. That word sound in the Greek is the Greek word echos, or echo. Or that word, it could also be translated the steps to fame. Or like spreading of a rumor. It, the echo means from person to person to person to person to person. Stage to stage to stage to stage to stage. Like we all have grown. You crawl, you walk, you run, you drive. Then somebody else drives you. <laughs> you know? On the day of Pentecost, one apostle remembered what Jesus said in that room 50 days ago. They were sitting there. They knew something was going to happen. And he started breathing loudly and dramatically, just like Jesus had done. Another heard it and repeated that same sound. And in moments, they were all doing it. They echoed the sound. They echoed the sound. Then now echo the light, verse 3. Then a flame appears, dividing into smaller flames and spreading from one person to the next. All the people present are filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in language they, they've never spoken as the Spirit empowers them. And they all see this huge flame, this pillar fall from the sky and it splits into 12 strands like a thick fiery rope with 12 different portions to it and it just unravels and then it goes on reaches out to each of the 12 and what's cool in the text it says and it sat upon each of them now the word upon and strongs is the word epi and upon doesn't just mean like sitting on top of your head like all the pictures you've ever seen whether it's a big tower of fire or just a little tongue of fire it's always just sitting right on top of them i'm going to show you something different and it doesn't take a lot of, lot of thinking to figure this out. You know, the, the uh, um, epi means to, to touch 
or to be upon. It also means, now get this, to superimpose or to overlay or to cover. It's not in, it's just totally encased. It's superimposed upon. You know, the apostles were totally engulfed in what looked like flames, much like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, except for they felt no heat. Well, I guess they didn't either, right? You know? I mean, it's like that. They're just, it's like it being engulfed in flames but not feeling any heat. You see, each one was alone, but they were all linked together by the same thing. It was an individual strand, and that's how unique the Spirit of God is. It's an individual strain just for you. It's designed that spiritual DNA is, is exactly what you need to be your very, very best. See, they could see each other through this super, super imposition of fire. They were encased by this, each one of them. That's what they saw. Imagine, it wasn't just a little thing of fire. It wasn't just fire touching their head. They were engulfed in this. It was superimposed over them. You ever seen a projector throwing an image onto a, a screen or a wall or a cloud or a group of people at a concert? You know what I'm saying? It could be stars. It could be clouds. It could be fire. Hey, fire. We'll use that one. Just, just uh, you know, if the image was fire, it could look like they're totally encased in fire but feel no heat. And with individual projectors for each one, it could have looked individually magnificent. That's what it was. They could see through it. They could see each other looking like that. Just imagine. But nobody else could see it who was in that temple that day. What a cool way that God showed them about the personal, individualized power associated with this new and improved version of Holy Spirit. He wanted them to know that they were smoking. They were hot. Here's a quote. Many highly intel intelligent people are poor thinkers. Many people of average intelligence are skilled thinkers. The power of the car is separate from the way the car is driven. Every person drives a little bit differently, don't they? I see these, these NASCAR racers. They're going 180, 200 miles an hour, whatever. I couldn't do it. I don't have the reactions like that. These people who, who drive these, these uh, fighter pilots and stuff, incredible reactions they must have. Everybody's different. Every single person is different, and God knows that. It doesn't mean one is less than another. It just means we're different, which is cool. Embrace your uniqueness. Stop trying to fit into society because you don't fit. If you fit, that means you're going exactly the way they're going. Like that term, birds of a feather flock together. The reason they, they flock together is they're all heading the same direction. I guarantee, and most of society is failing. So if you're going the way of the flock, you're probably going the wrong way. And that quote was from Edward D. Bono. And um, that must have been a sight for the 12 apostles to see. The context shows that none of the bystanders noticed this fiery phenomenon, only the apostles. How do I know this? Because no one ever mentions it. And that was a chatty group. They talked about everything, as we'll see in a moment. And some teachers say the image of fire came before the breathing. Other teachers say it came after. The point is, I really don't know. Did it tip them off to when to start breathing? I don't know. Could have. Did, did them breathing tip God off to, to, man, to send the picture? I don't know. I don't care. But basically, three, point, three things were about to happen here. You know, they breathed heavily and loudly like Jesus taught. You know, the apostles saw this huge pillar of fire appear, split 12 ways, and engulf each of them, encase them, superimposed over them. And then they all spoke a language they didn't understand. They all spoke in tongues. After breathing and peering through the overlay of flames, speaking in tongues was the first act of Christianity. There must be some profound significance to speaking in tongues. 
There must be some grand importance to speaking in tongues. There's got to be something. There has to be a reason. Most Christians do it, maybe, you know, the ones that do it, they do it a couple of times a year. Very seldom. I've been with groups that, that did it all the time. You know, they said they did. They, pra- they practice it. And the average length of time people did it was three to five minutes a day. That's the average. You know, so I don't know. I mean, it's got to be, there's a reason for it. And uh, verse 5, because of the holy festival, uh, there are devout Jews staying as pilgrims in Jerusalem from every nation under the sun. They hear the sound and the crowd gathers. They're amazed because each of them can hear the group speaking in their native languages. They are shocked and amazed by this. Pilgrims. Just a minute. Aren't all these people Galileans? How in the world do we all hear our native languages being spoken? Look, there are Parthians here, and Medes, and Elamites, and Mesopotamians, and Judeans, residents of Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. You know, there's, uh, there, there's uh, Phrygians, there's Pamphylians, Egyptians, there's Libyans from Cyrene, and Romans, including both Jews by birth and converts. Cretans and Arabs were each in our own language hearing these people talk about God's powerful deeds. Their amazement becomes confusion as they wonder, pilgrims, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does it mean these people talk in, the, talk in our languages? They're from Galilee. They're stupid. They're just fishermen and farmers, carpenters, tradesmen, skeptics. Verse 13, it doesn't mean anything. They're all drunk on some fresh wine. Now, don't you think if they had seen these columns of fire, that would be brought into the conversation here? Why do you think it's not brought in? They couldn't see it. It also tells me something here that spiritually you're going to be able to see things that nobody else on earth will be able to see. Remember uh, the man of God and he had the servant Gehazi and they were surrounded by the enemy and he said, God, God, he said, God, open the kid's eyes so he can see what's really happening. And then God showed this kid by revelation just a huge army and chariots of fire in the sky. There was more to protect him than there was against. I guarantee you there's more to protect you and to help you and to heal you and to direct you and to guide you than the world has any idea of. You can see what nobody else sees. Verse 14, as the twelve stood together, Peter shouted to the crowd. He shouted to the crowd. Peter. Men of Judea and all who are staying here in Jerusalem, listen. I want you to understand, these people aren't drunk as you may think. Look, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. No, this isn't drunkenness. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. Hear what God says. Now, Peter is going to express God's vision of us living with this new, incredible version of Holy Spirit. The prophet Joel saw this thousands of years ago. And he was able to see a little piece, a reflection of that mystery, a reflection of this new version of Holy Spirit. Nobody had this before this this time. And Joel saw it. It's just a little bit of unveiling. And here's what he said. In the last days, I'll offer my spirit to humanity as a libation. That's a drink. Your children will boldly speak the word of the Lord. Young warriors will see visions, and your elders will dream dreams. Yes, in those days, I shall offer my spirit to all servants, both male and female. And they will boldly speak my word. Now, let's break this down. 
in words that we can understand. The Spirit is as easy to receive as a glass of water. It's available to anyone on earth. Anyone on earth. It's available to all humanity. Not just your church. That Spirit, if utilized, can give us newfound boldness and will help eradicate any fear that we may have. And most of our fears are fear of success. We hold ourselves back from success. The spirit, the spirit can show you visions or inspire you, no matter how mature you are spiritually. Even the brand new believers, they can, they can see visions and they can be inspired to do good, to do right, to avoid wrong. And the Spirit of God will show the more advanced believers what they need to see as well as how they can help guide others to avoid the traps of the enemy. And finally, this new type of spirit is available not just to men, but to you lovely ladies. Remember, that was pretty much a man's world at that time, wasn't it? It's a man's world. <laughs> The Middle East still thinks it's a man's world. Some Christian groups think it, it's still a man's world. This right here is telling you right here. It, it's, it's available to man and woman, any nationality, from any past religion. God doesn't care. Why should we? Young, old, man, woman, child, dark, light, Medium, it doesn't matter. God will give it if you want it. And I tell you, folks, if you want revelation, if you want to learn how to operate this gift, God will show you if you want it. A lot of people are afraid. Sometimes God shows you things you don't want to see. Sometimes God shows you things about yourself you don't want to see. And sometimes that's, that's, that's frightening. But it's enlightening at the same time. See, and I, I love how that section really closes with, with, uh, with boldness and lack of fear again. It's put in there twice. So this, so this Spirit of God that we have must be able to help us in some special way how to get over fear, how to eradicate fear. And fear, I'm not talking about being afraid of a of a wolf in the woods, you know, that might be a smart fear or a bear, or, you know, whatever, a rattlesnake, you know, you don't pick it up by its nose, you know, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I think that, uh, I think there's some, some, there's a reason for it, but it's got to be more than it's talking about when, when something is available for you and, and we, we just can't get it, have, we don't have the guts to go get it. That's fear. When you know you should be delivered of something. You know, and I just don't have the discipline to help myself. That's fear. You know, it's just, it's just something that keeps you from being the person you're designed to be. Verse 17 and 18 are talking about what's possible for us right now. Verses 19 and 20 are going to talk about what's going to happen in the future. And it's amazing, again, how Joel saw these things thousands of years prior. Verse 19, And the heaven above... And on the earth below, I shall give signs of impending judgment, blood, fire, and, and clouds of smoke. The sun will become a void of darkness. ruh -roh. <laughs> And the moon will become blood. Then the, great, then the great and dreadful day of the Lord will arrive. Now clearly this is talking about some point in the future. The word dreadful can also be translated notable or memorable. The memorable day. What a day that's going to be. Because everyone's going to be raised back up. Everybody on earth over time will. Everybody. Think that's going to be a surprise? You went through whatever meat grinder of a life you went through, and then you come out, hey, <laughs> this is pretty cool. 
You see, the notable or memorable day of the Lord. Something amazing is going to happen. And now, then it jumps back to now in the next verse. Verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be liberated into God's freedom and peace. That's the third time it talks about eradication of fear. Because you can't have peace if you have fear. You don't have freedom if you have fear. Isn't that wild? And the power that's available to us has been echoed in part for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And we're, are we keeping that echo alive? Is it more than just education? Is it more than just training? The proof is in the doing. I used to always hear, the proof is in the pudding. And it never made sense to me. The proof is in the tasting. Right? The proof is in the eating. It's doing something with that pudding, if you're a pudding person. See, the proof is in the doing. The proof is in, is in the, the giving, the living, the passing on, the how of this gift. Let's echo Pentecost. Let's echo it. Let's live without fear. Let's live bold, boldly. Let's expect revelation. Let's expect vision. Let's guide the young. Let's help the old. Let's do whatever it takes, man, woman, child, whatever religion they're in. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Because I guarantee the world's trying to make Christianity ashamed of who they are. Even Christians don't even know what, a, what Christianity is. They think it's going to a church, wearing a big decoration around their neck, and having a big old hairdo to make them closer to God. You see? I mean, it, it's just, it's so big. And the cool thing is God works in all these Christians. A lot of times more than they even realize. They don't even have to speak in tongues. Imagine if they did. And they did it consistently on a daily basis. So it's wild. You know, let's echo Pentecost. Now echoing the gift. How do we best utilize this custom made for us, this designer version of the gift of Holy Spirit? How do we utilize it? First, we must, must each take it personally. And we need to take our self-education seriously. See, no one can, te can teach you to be you but you and God. Nobody can teach you to be you. Do people try to mold you into what they want you to be? Yeah, if you let them. This whole world is that way. That's why people are failing so, poor, so badly. That's why it's so messed up. Because people don't run on, on their own feet. They just, they just keep retweeting what somebody else said instead of thinking on their own. Here's a quote. Be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Oscar Wilde. Believe it or not, formal education, be it secular or biblical, at times suppresses our, lear our learning. We need more. You know, we must take our personal development seriously. We're each unique. So you have a whole unique curriculum. What do you need? A book that blesses you may not bless me at all. And something I read, I always want to hand it out and tell everybody how great it is, and they look at it and go, eh, not for me. It doesn't matter. I'm excited. <laughs> you know, you may hand me a book that doesn't touch me at that time. Maybe it will in a month or a year. See, we're supposed to live and, and act matchless, uh, um, irreplaceable. We are peerless. You know, that Holy Spirit will, will help you find the true you. That's part of the beauty of it. It exposes who you are. Like I heard recently, time, doing something over a period of time will either advance you or expose you. If you stay faithful with what I'm about to teach, it's either going to advance your career, advance you as a human, or or it's going to expose something to you, which is, you know, could be a very good thing. But the Spirit of God will expose the posers. Don't act religious. Be righteous. See, it's going to help you find the true you. It's going to help you be what you're designed to be. It's going to help you see what only you can see. Quote, everybody is a genius. 
But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. Albert Einstein. Now, this is one of the smartest guys that we, that we know. He said everybody's a genius. So where's your genius? What are you a genius in? What are, you a, are you a genius in, in, in taking care of people? Are you a genius at, at, at being a great supporter? Are you, being, be, are you a genius at, I mean, what are you fill in the blank? You don't have to be a math genius. If it was all it's cranked up to be, then only people with a high IQ would get the Spirit of God. I've seen people, I've seen people who were considered handicapped mentally, retarded, they used to say in the day, who, who could not live on, on their own. And I, I led them into speaking in tongues. It's not how smart you are, folks. The Spirit of God has, it can help anybody. And that person has just as much a place and, and, a, and a job and a calling as I do. Here's another one about genius. Quote, genius is an exceedingly common human quality, probably natural to most of us. John Taylor Gatto. It should be natural, our genius. What's your genius? Let it shine. Let your light shine. Quote, there's nothing in a caterpillar that tells you it's going to be a butterfly. Butterfly. There's nothing in a caterpillar that tells you it's going to be a butterfly. That, that's Buckminster Fuller. It doesn't look like a butterfly. It doesn't look like it's going to become one. You, that person you're talking to may not look like they're ever going to do anything. Well, maybe that's because they believed what the world taught them their whole life. It's time to change, folks. It's time to become the genius that you are. Echo Pentecost. We need the Spirit of God if we're ever going to get past this one point. The Spirit of God can help you flow and grow and be free. Quote, what does education often do? It makes a straight-cut ditch of a free meandering brook. Henry David Thoreau. What's more pleasant to look at? A meandering brook? going through the trees, or just some ditch some, some farmer cut to move water? You see, quote, it is a miracle that curiosity survives formal education. Albert Einstein, again. It's a miracle that curiosity survives formal education. See, this includes biblical education, folks. Some say, you can only go as far as you've been taught. You ever heard that? That's not true, folks. If that was true, that, I mean, that, if you're a follower, that's true. How many of you are followers? Show of hands. How many of you want to live your life as a follower doing what everybody else tells you to do? Well, that's a true statement. You only go as far as you've been taught. The genius in you begs to differ. You can break every barrier, conquer every fear. You can be, you can go places and do things that no one else has the ability to do. No one else on earth can be you. Everyone else is taken. Be the genius of who you are. That's Pentecost. Allow that Spirit of God to work in you so that you can shine and love and give. See, like each apostle who is encased in that see-through overlay of flame, you have an individual gift, an amazing individual light to share with the world. You're crazy amazing, folks. That's the power of Pentecost. You're crazy amazing. If you have no discipline, you're never going to operate that spirit of God. It's body, soul, and spirit. If you're sick all the time, it's hard to do it. It's hard, hard to really serve and give like you're designed to. So try to keep yourself healthy, or get healthy if you can. And if not, just do the best you can. Work your mind. Build the mind. Don't just go with whatever any politician tells you to think or any talking head on the news. 
Oh my gosh, think for yourself. You know, thinking's not going out of style. You see, the quote, the best teachers are those that show you where to look, but don't tell you what to see. Alexandra K. Tenfor. The best teachers are those who show you where to look, but don't tell you what to see. That's not our modern educational system, folks. Quote, each of us has a spark of life inside us, and our highest endeavor ought to be to set off that spark in one another. Kenny Asbuell. You know, each of us plays a different part. Each learns a bit differently. We all play a different tune. We walk by a different beat. Each of us brings out the best in ourselves, and then we are able to bring out the best in another. You can't jump from a beginner to a leader. There's a whole process. You learn, you do, then you model or you follow, and then you lead or you teach. It's really a four-step process. But every step we can, we can be better, we can get better and better and better incrementally. You know, so quote, learning is not a spectator sport. Anonymous. So many people, they just want to, they watch their lives go by. Or they live vicariously through some sports athlete or some some TV hero or or you know somebody who lives an exciting life. Hey, your life can be as exciting as you can handle. In fact, your life is as exciting as you, do, you have decided to handle. You want it to get more exciting? You want it to be better? You want it to prosper more? You want to see yourself move faster, greater, bigger steps? You got to get involved in your own life. Here's the 1% the, the rule. I'm not sure if I taught this before. I think I talked about it. But if you could discipline yourselves to, to, to better yourself just 1% each day, you would be 100% better in 100 days. Sounds easy. Just 1%. That's like one penny out of a dollar. It's not much. 1% a day. In 100 days, you'll be 100% better. But if it really were that easy, the whole world would be a different place. It's not that easy because people aren't disciplined enough to keep it up. And most of us are awake about 18 hours a day, which is, which is 1,080 hours a day, a minutes a day, not hours, minutes a day. And those are the only minutes that we have to work with. And if you break it down to 1%, divide you know, 1080 by 100, and you come up with, with 10.8, or we'll just boil it down to 10 minutes a day is about 1% of your time. You want to better yourself 1% a day? Then give 10, 10 minutes to yourself. Give 10 minutes to improving yourself every day. Could you do that? Most people can't. They'll do it for two or three days, maybe a week, and then they just slip back into their old habits. 10 minutes. You think you could spend 10 minutes a day improving yourself. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to do some crazy talk here, folks. Let's triple 10. What's three times 10? Somebody. 30 minutes. What if you gave 10 minutes for your body a day? What if you gave 10 minutes for your soul or your mind? And you gave 10 minutes for your spiritual growth or for speaking in tongues or whatever? 30 minutes. Imagine how you'd be in 100 days if you actually could do this faithfully every day for 10 minutes or 30 minutes. Physically, exercise in some way. Get your heart rate up at least 10 minutes a day. It doesn't take much. Mentally, read a great book for 10 minutes a day. A book that challenges you, you to grow as a person. Or a book, that, book that, wants to, that inspires you to be the person you're meant to be. And spiritually, if you're thinking about echoing Pentecost, how about learning to speak in tongues? Or if you already know it, know how to do it, why don't you try doing it a little bit? Try doing it on your drive to work every day. You drive about 10, 15, 20 minutes to work. Whoa! 
You'd be crazy. 20 minutes. Woo! Listen to a tape. Back to mentally. Listen to that on your drive. Some good tape that, that helps you. Not just a, sto- a love story, you know? Those are nice, but they don't really... That's, you're living in somebody else's dream when you read that. Something that helps you is what I'm talking about. You see, 10 minutes a day. What about praying for 10 minutes a day? Asking God to teach you how to excel spiritually. What if you went over your goals for 10 minutes every day? That's all you did. You, every day at night, you go, okay, what did I do? Or you review your day. Just spend 10 minutes in the evening before you go to bed. Okay, how did I do? Did I do it? Did I work on my body? Did I work on my soul? Did I work on my spirit? Yes. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Oops. You know, and the next day you're not going to want to answer to that guy in the mirror. You know, you're not going to want to every day say you fail. Just get, make it a habit. You'll change. Imagine by investing 30 minutes a day to improve yourself, you could, you could dynamically and dramatically change your life in about three months. How would you like to be a much better version of you in three months? You can, folks. 1%. The 1% rule. See, if a man doesn't, quote, if a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it's because he hears a different drummer. You know, let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. The row. Just because you don't feel like, like you think other people think you're supposed to feel, don't worry about it. Be your own genius. Live your own life. Enjoy who you are. Love you. It's a lot easier to love other people then. You know, all men who have turned out worth anything have had the the chief hand in their own education. Sir Walter Scott. Everybody who's ever been anything takes responsibility for their own actions. Be responsible. You know, it's your life. You know, the more we blame somebody else, the more we give them the power. If you hear yourself, if you hear that coming out of your mouth, you're on a loser's course. It's just the way it is. I've been there. I've been so angry at a job I had that everything came out of my mouth was negatives about a certain, certain group to where I got sick of being around myself. And finally, I thought, I'll take a t- taste of my own medicine. I'm going to leave that that job, you know, and do something that I enjoy doing. I mean, why waste your life living someone else's dream? Quote, people only see what they're prepared to see. Ralph Waldo Emerson. People only see what they're prepared to see. You think a baby, I mean, you see them, a baby, they walk across the floor, they put something in their mouth, they touch it, they, you know, they, then they throw it and they move to the next thing. They're learning all they can learn at that point about that. What does it taste like? What does it feel like? What does it, hear? What does it sound like? What does it smell like? You know, they use all their senses and they toss it and they move on to the next. They're just learning machines. Why, why, why do we stop? Where did we stop? What caused us to stop? The point is, you may never get those answers. Just start. Start with 1%. Um, let me see here. Quote, no matter how good teaching may be, each student must take the responsibility for his own education. John Carlos. Take responsibility for your own growth, your own education. Stop waiting on everybody else to make you prosper. It's nobody else's job. It's nobody else's job. So why am I going on and on about Consistent and persistent self-education. Because if we take on the responsibility to understand our unique gift, we can fulfill our callings and we will change the world. How would you like to fully fulfill your calling? So in closing, for 2,000 years we Christians have known about the amazing gift of the Holy Spirit. And many of us have been taught about the powerful, manifested, original outpouring of our gift of Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But I ask you, what are you doing with that knowledge? 
what are you doing with that knowledge? You know, you can, you see, quote, education is not the filling of a pill, but the lighting of a fire. Yates. Education is the light of a fire. It's not just filling this young, empty heads with knowledge. You ever crammed for a test? We all have. And then in a week, do you remember that stuff? Not usually. That's not education. That's regurgitation. On the day of Pentecost, the apostles were touched from head to toe, inside out, with an individualized portion of Holy Spirit. They had spiritual DNA made just for them. They, were, they, were made such an, they then made such an amazing impact on society because they, were, they had developed themselves in their body. They developed themselves in their soul and thinking life. And they developed themselves every day on their, their spiritual, uh, spiritual life. It takes developing all three in order to live a complete life and to live like a complete person. You want to be a complete person? Body, soul, spirit. Work on it every day. Each day we must try to improve our health. Each day we take the time to develop our mind by pushing ourselves mentally and socially. And by all means, we get in touch with who we are and we get a handle on developing what we have spiritually. Let's light the fire under ourselves and improve ourselves each and every day. We do this physically, mentally, and spiritually. Let's increase and let's spread the wealth of who we are because you are amazing. And let's do this each and every day. The 1% rule. Give yourself 10 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day. Echo the gift. Echo the spirit of that gift. Echo the heat. Echo the light. Echo the heart. That is how we echo Pentecost. God bless.